Welcome back to another episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst, and returning to the podcast for her second appearance is Dr. Nicole LaPera. Dr. Nicole was trained in clinical psychology at Cornell University, the New School for Social Research, and the Philadelphia School of Psychoanalysis. She's the author of the number one New York Times bestselling book, How to Do the Work, and the podcast host of Self Healer Soundboard. As a clinical psychologist in private practice, Dr. Nicole often found herself frustrated by the limitations of traditional psychotherapy. Wanting more for her patients and for self, she began a journey to develop a united philosophy of mental, physical, and spiritual health that equips people with the tools necessary to heal themselves. Dr. Nicole is the creator of the hashtag self healers movement, where people from around the world are joining together in a community to take healing into their own hands. In 2019, she founded Self Healer Circle, the first virtual self-guided global healing membership. Self Healer Circle has members in over 60 countries who heal as a collective. Her latest workbook, How to Meet Yourself, will release on December 6th. So let's get this conversation going and welcome Dr. Nicole LaPera back to the Adversity Advantage podcast. Nicole, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you. I'm super excited to dive in and talk about the theme of your newest book, your newest workbook, How to Meet Yourself. But I think a good place for us to start is so many people right now, they're stressed, they're overwhelmed, they're anxious, they're dysregulated, their nervous system is on overdrive. But a lot of people just aren't even aware that that's what's going on. So what are the signs that somebody's nervous system is dysregulated? And, and what are some steps that they can take to bring them back to a place of self-regulation? I really appreciate it. I think this is an amazing place to start, Doug. I was actually just reading a comment um, in our my self-healer circle, our member portal, my uh, global membership. And one of the members similarly was learning how integral and foundational our nervous system is. And I think the language that that member used was, my mind is blown. And I can affirm that my mind was blown too, because our nervous system really runs our day-to-day -day choices. And to a large extent, its impact, like your, your sharing, is outside um, of our awareness. And so many of us are stuck in a type of stress response and having and living within that impact and not really sure of why we're stuck in that way. So just to understand stress really quickly, our nervous system is always on alert outside of our awareness. It's scanning our environment for one major cue. And the cue is related to our safety because our nervous system is primarily motivated to keep our physical organism alive. So it's scanning really simply for a threat. And if a threat, I'm just going to describe kind of the nervous system response because then that will uncover the different symptoms of these different states of dysregulation. So when we're scanning, if everything seems safe, we feel calm, we feel open, we feel present. And a lot of times we feel connected to ourselves, our body, and to others in our environment or to our environment itself. We are in the parasympathetic state. The technical name is the ventral vagal system, which really just means we're calm, we're connected, we're open, we're safe in our environment. Now, the moment where we perceive a threat our nervous system, our sympathetic nervous system, and probably listeners have heard of it, labeled the fight or flight response kicks in, where our first attempt to find safety is to fight off whatever we perceive to be threatening. And the way our body does that is it mobilizes us for action. Our heart rate begins to increase. Our blood begins to pump. Maybe you can even feel your blood pumping through your veins. You might start to, to sweat a little bit. You might start to breathe a little bit more heavily. You're simply getting ready to, I mean, think about when we want to fight someone or when we are fighting someone, whether or not it's physically or with our words, right? We're activated. So just think about how your body feels in that moment. And typically our breath is impacted. Like I said, it gets really quickened in this state of fight readiness. Our muscles are impacted. We're mobilized, ready to run, to fight, to take action. And a lot of times our heart rate will shift. Now, if we can't fight off, very similarly, we might flee. Same thing. Our heart rate, the blood, we're pumping through our muscles. We're getting ready to take action. So those are all signs and symptoms that your nervous system is in that state of dysregulation. It perceives, A, a threat in our environment, and it's mobilizing its energy and its resources to take action against that threat. Now, when, if the circumstances are that we can't physically fight, the threat is just too overwhelming for us, or we can't physically leave the environment, oftentimes in childhood where we're dependent, we can't actually flee our childhood homes, 
what will happen next is our nervous system will shift us into a state of shutdown. This will look like, so in contrast to blood mobilizing ready for action, we actually, our heart rate begins to slow. Our breath might become even imperceptible or barely there. We might begin to hold our breath a bit. Our muscles might even go limp entirely. We could think about lizards a lot of time are used, but any sort of animal that is quote unquote playing dead. Because at that moment, when we can't fight or flee, escape the threat at hand, our best option is to play dead or to act as if we're not threatening so that the threat itself leaves. So a lot of times, some of us are stuck in that state of demobilization where we have no energy, where we're often holding our breath, or maybe we can't even tell that we're breathing throughout the day. Our muscles might always feel fatigued or our energy might often feel fatigued and our muscles feeling limp. And those are then signs. So while, of course, the stress response is set up to come back or allow us to come back into that safe, calm place that I was describing initially, once the threat has been taken care of, oftentimes so many of us are stuck in that. And then we live within those symptoms of dysregulation. It's funny, as you were describing that, I'm like, yep, I felt that. Yep, felt that. Yep, been there. Yep, done that. And one of the things that I had a trouble with, and I can't remember if we talked about this on the first episode or not, was that you know I had a lot of unhealthy coping mechanisms and unhealthy stress response, unhealthy stress response, like pathways, I guess you could call it in my brain from childhood that I wasn't aware of. I thought it was just my present day was stressing me out so much that it was causing all this, you know, stress, anxiety. I was feeling drained all the time and I couldn't put my finger on to why it happened. Like how can somebody know the difference between if it's like whatever is stressing them out is actually something that is their job, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's just their unhealthy habits versus they're just creating almost like a bigger response than is necessary because of something that happened in their past. I appreciate you sharing that experience of kind of seeing all of those different states, but also the confusion, you know, that happens as we, as many of us carry that trauma or that dysregulation or those very patterned coping skills from childhood forward. And kind of figuring out the difference, I think, is one of the major goals of this type of healing. First, like you're describing, coming to the awareness that my body is in some sort of stress response. So many of us live in our heads. We're reacting from that very stressed out place, but we're not actually dropped into our body to notice that, yes, our body is reacting in a, to a particular experience or circumstance from a stressed perspective. And like you're sharing, we become very habited in the way that we deal with it because the way that we learn to cope with stress or really any emotion begins in childhood and is formed in the relationship between ourselves and our primary caregiver, where the main goal of that relationship is actually to keep us safe and to keep us regulated. When we don't have safe environments, safe caregivers, when there's active abuse or when we're not given or modeled the tools to cope with stress, then we begin to perceive even daily stressors as being overwhelming, as initiating these different degrees of the stress response. So very similar to you, in my late 20s, I discovered that my lifelong feelings of disconnection, of difficulty, you know, really attuning to my emotions, of numbness even at times, and of all of the ways that I try to distract myself through work, through, you know, drinking, through doing things to keep myself distanced, for me was actually a function of my nervous system. It was a state of that shutdown where because I didn't necessarily have the tools, even daily stressors were setting me up to activate that stress response. So getting that clarity really means first dropping in and discovering whether or not our body is dysregulated, learning, of course, how to even return to that place of safety so that we can have the awareness of whether it's happening now or whether it's coming from the past. And a really simple, great marker is when our emotion or our reaction is really big or is disproportionate. You know, we're screaming, we're yelling, we're running away and not speaking to someone based on a daily event. Whenever something is bigger in response, typically, and it's not all the time, but we can get curious and begin to explore the possibility 
that it's very real what we're feeling. But again, like you're sharing, it might be coming from an earlier place of that dysregulation and that overwhelm. And I think it's it's really important to pay attention to all this now because I think collectively people are more stressed, they're more on edge, they're more dysregulated, they're more anxious, and people are having a hard time. And I think in order to kind of get back to that sense of self and understand who we truly are, who we truly want to be, so we can be able to change these patterns and move forward, we have to be able to regulate ourselves in the world that we live in, because let's face it, like life's not fair, life's not going to be easy, there's going to be challenging times, and you have to persevere and go through despite that. So like, what's the path look like to kind of recalibrate their nervous system so that, you know, maybe give some examples of like what that looks like in the short term of all right, like I'm super dysregulated right now, I need to bring myself like back down. And then like, what are some maybe daily habits like so that long term, this can become more second nature and it doesn't have to be, you know, as big of a deal, if you will. Yeah, really, really, you know, important question because regardless, to kind of go back to your previous question, regardless of the reaction we're having, regardless of whether or not it was based in the past or the present, it's what's here now. And creating that safety in this present moment is what's incredibly important. It's not necessary even to be like, oh, well, this is from the past because in right here, right now, my nervous system is reacting as if it's present. So embodying throughout my work, and one of the major reasons I put out this new workbook was to really emphasize how important the actual practical applications or embodying these new tools are. It's not enough just to say, oh yes, I'm dysregulated now because in childhood I didn't have safety. It's so much more important to create that safety in this moment now. So to really simplify the different states of nervous system regulation. If you find yourself in either of those states of fight or flee, again, where our blood is pumping through our veins, getting us ready, our muscles are tense and ready for action. I might be breathing at a quickened pace. I'm ready to, again, fight or flee the threat at hand. What we want to do is calm our nervous system. We can calm our nervous system in a couple different ways. Two foundational ways I like to offer as really easy um, foundational tools are first by using our attention. So by putting our attention fully on the present moment, because when we become stressed, our mind starts to race, just like our body and our you know energy starts to race. We begin to think and worry about this threat at hand and about what might happen in the future. So by refocusing our attention on the present moment, we can use a, a hook in that present moment, which can be our physical body. You can either put your attention on how it feels to be firmly grounded or planted in the chair or the ground you're standing on, or you can tap into your senses, asking yourself really quickly, what's one thing I can see, touch, taste here in this moment? We're activating our awareness in the present moment. A second tool is through using your breath. So while your breath is becoming more quickened, getting ready to deal with the threat at hand, you can learn how to breathe more deeply, more calmly, more evenly. I like to reference a deep belly breath, which can look like putting a hand on your belly and just teaching yourself while your normal rhythm is starting to increase, right? Teaching yourself how to calm your breath in that moment. So when we're elevated, when we're in fight or flight, we want to de-escalate our stress response by bringing our body calm. Now, if we're on the other side of that spectrum and we're stuck in that shutdown, I have no energy, I have no attention, I can barely feel myself breathing, I'm lethargic, then we want to actually stimulate our body. We can do so with vigorous movement, do five jumping jacks, shake in our chair, and we can also do so by stimulating our breath. So instead of calm, deep breaths, maybe some quick <laughs> chest-based breath. So when we're under-stimulated, we want to stimulate the activity of our nervous system. That's, that's great advice. And I know that's something that has helped me a lot is learning to experience some of these uncomfortable feelings and emotions that come through when I'm stressed and being able to focus on what I can control. And that one thing that I can control is my breath and staying present in that moment and focusing on that part, because eventually, like whatever you're going through is going to subside, right? You know, if typically, if we're in like one of these normal, like fight or flight responses that we get triggered by something, like normally we 
we go through it and we feel a little bit better. And I can imagine that people that when they continue to do this day in and day out, they'll start to rewire their nervous system and eventually change the way they respond to stress. But I know one of the things that you talked about in your new book that I think so many people struggle with is this resistance mentally that comes up to where they start to do the work. And it's I think this is parallels to anything in life where you're making a choice for the better that you automatically think that because you're making a choice to better yourself, that all of a sudden that path is going to be super easy because you're making a good choice. And we all know that's not the case. But what advice would you have for somebody that's listening to this that maybe has started this path of self-healing or maybe they're going to you know, embark on this journey after listening to this and they start to do this stuff for a few days and they realize like life's still hard. Like why aren't I feeling any better, right? Like, like what advice do you have for someone like that? Well, Doug, you mentioned something really profound and even mentioning the importance of the consistency of these actions first and foremost because I think a lot of us – especially when we hear of these new tools, oh, there's a way I can calm my stress, you know, my stress reaction when I'm in fight or flight or stimulate my body when I'm feeling really shut down. I think a lot of us kind of, you know, put that in our back pocket for that moment in real time when the acute stressor is here and I really need it. We're not going to set ourselves up to necessarily succeed if that is our mentality and our approach to this for a couple different reasons. A, when we're in a stressed response, that's when we're most likely to drop back into those older habits. Our brain actually is wired so much that when our emotional brain, I'm really simplifying a lot of this neuroscience, but when our limbic system or our emotional brain is lit up, when we're having a feeling, when we're perceiving a threat, we actually lose access to that powerful prefrontal cortex part of our brain that remembers this new tool that can plan for the future, that can you know remind me of how these old coping mechanisms don't work, so I wanna do this new thing. All of that actually goes offline in that acute moment of stress. So a lot of us, we don't set ourselves up to succeed when we're like, oh, great tool, I'll use it when I need it, because chances are we're not going to remember it because our brain won't allow us to remember it when we need it, or to speak to your point you're making now, it'll be so unfamiliar to us. And I say the word unfamiliar so often in all of my work, because as humans, we are wired, our nervous system that is, is wired to avoid the unfamiliar at all cost. Because in the unfamiliar is the possibility of the threat that we continue to talk about. When If I don't know what comes next, it could be something that might be life-threatening. So my brain is wired to prefer those old worn pathways, even the ones that come with all of those negative consequences. Like you're saying, it's so counterintuitive that many of us have lived a lifetime of, oh, all of these things don't work. And here's all of the evidence why they don't work. To my brain, I make a new logical choice to create change. It's solely going to register to my subconscious as possibly threatening, so to be avoided. And so what resistance can look like for all of us is some of us, it lands in our minds. All of the reasons why we explain away the need to do this new thing. We argue ourselves of why it's not working or we distract ourselves from doing it in our thoughts. And for some of us, it drops into our body. We begin to experience new sensations that we're not familiar with. And before long, for some of us, it's a couple hours. For others, a couple days, a couple months, a couple weeks, we're right back into that familiar pattern. So anytime we're doing something new and when we're trying to regulate our nervous system, it really does mean creating consistency in all of those daily actions, even outside of what we're talking about in terms of regulating a stress response. I oftentimes talk about caring for a nervous system in general, making sure that our body is getting the nutrients it needs so that the cells in our brain and in our nervous system are able to have the energy to function, making sure that our body is getting the sleep. I know that's one area that very few of us as adults really prioritize. Our nervous system needs times of rest. Our body needs actually some, our muscles need some version of movement or stretching throughout our day. So outside of acute moments to deal with the stress response, I'm very interested in creating the daily habits around just general nervous system health so that by the time this moment comes, not only am I connected to my body that's having a stress response, my tools are a little less unfamiliar. I become more likely to be able to maintain this new focus and these new choices in real time when we really need them. 
you know, preparation and consistency is so key. And you touched on something that I think is so important and that you have to do the best you can to prepare yourself for these moments that you know when you go on this journey are going to come. Like, you know that when you go and you're trying to go back into the past and unlearn some unhealthy patterns, or you're going to try to heal some trauma or just change the way you think, it's going to be challenging. And so really making sure you're preparing yourself to the best of your ability to do that. I mean, you touched on fear and like people have trouble with uncertainty. And sometimes it becomes so overwhelming that they almost think their way out of doing anything because the, the fear takes over and the, the fear of what actually could happen is so far removed from what actually is going on or what realistically could happen that, you know, people don't take some of these choices that you're encouraging people to make that I encourage people to make from the fitness side. And they end up just in the same place. Like, how do you help maybe some of the people in your coaching program that you have, or even what have you used for yourself that has helped you like navigate through fear and having the courage to be vulnerable and take that first step? I really, really appreciate this question, Doug. And the first thing I want to offer is that, in my opinion, at least I think fear oftentimes gets a, a really bad rap. When we feel fearful or when we witness fear in ourselves, we tend to, or a lot of us tend to shame ourselves or have this idea, you know, that fear doesn't, you know, isn't helpful. And in the reality of things, fear actually has a very adaptive function. And chances are, if you are someone who is governed by fear, always, you know, repeating the worst case scenario, I would imagine that somewhere in your early experience or your early environment, that actually was adaptive. There was value in living in your head and replaying all of the possible things that could go wrong because doing that allowed you to remain in whatever semblance of safety you were able to create in that early environment. So the first offering I want to suggest is to have compassion when you witness your body in this nervous system response or when you see right those what if or hypothetical thoughts racing through your mind as dysregulating as upsetting as they are you know instead of shaming or criticizing or even trying to power them away i think that's a, another time another aspect that is a kind of misunderstanding of how to work with our mind because there is no time where we can shut our thoughts off. And I think if that's our intention to get to this place where I can battle my thoughts away or, you know, not have a thought, again, that's going to be an expectation that we're not going to be able to meet. So when we see those, you know, ruminative, hypothetical, what if fear inducing thoughts, we can shift that perspective, just maybe begin to view them objectively not criticizing ourselves for having them and compassionately even understanding that that was protective at some time. Though of course now, wherever we are into our adulthood, we might want to learn a new relationship. We might want to teach ourselves how to venture, right? A little more into that unknown by, you know, making that new choice that our coach is suggesting we make. And the way we want to do that is so small. We want to do so incrementally. We don't want to, you know, set ourselves up to fail by creating a, a whole new life from top to bottom tomorrow, as I know some of us attempt to do when things aren't working out, when we start to work with a new coach, right? We get all of these new tools, even maybe listening to my work. I talk about many different things we can do. And a lot of us have this idea that, okay, great. If I do all of them, you know, starting tomorrow, I'll feel better sooner. And while that's completely understandable, especially when we're feeling terrible or we're suffering in whatever way, that's going to, the more new we do, the more overwhelmed things can become. So I talk often in my work about concept of creating and keeping a small daily promise. So whatever the promise is of the new choice that anyone wants to make, the new choice that your coach is suggesting that you make, making sure that it's small, it's attainable. It's not five new things starting tomorrow. It's one new thing because that one new thing, anticipate that it will challenge you. You'll meet some resistance. And each and every time you keep making that promise, despite the discomfort of that promise, you're rebuilding that confidence in yourself to keep making that choice and expanding your ability to tolerate more and more of that discomfort as you venture more and more into that unknown. Absolutely. And I think stuff like that, it's almost twofold with the level of confidence that comes with it. Like the first thing is you typically feel better, like doing whatever that thing is, you know, you should have done, whether that was asking somebody out that you were afraid of asking out or going for a walk 
you know, hiring a coach, whatever it was. And then you feel more confident because you're giving yourself like the love and care that you know you should have done. And you're just so happy that you faced that challenge and overcame it. So you're almost getting this double boost in confidence when you're, you know, leaning into that fear and taking a chance on yourself and betting on yourself. And I know, obviously, you coach like thousands of people in, in your self healers community. And I'm sure there's plenty of common themes in it. But like, what would you say is the most common theme of a person who comes in? Like, what are they typically like struggling with? And then what have you found like once they experience some level of healing and prosperity in your program? Like, what was it that they needed? I think most, a lot of roads lead back to some sort of issue, difficulty, struggle, stuck point in our relationships, whether or not it's in our relationships with ourselves, having, you know, the members or the humans who don't feel like they have confidence, don't feel good about themselves, don't feel good about maybe the work that they're doing or how they're showing up in the world. They don't feel kind of a positive idea of who they are as self. And even more so, we see that then mapped onto, I then struggle in my relationships. I don't feel connected. I don't feel fulfilled, or I keep feeling the same sort of emotions in my relationships. Because ultimately, we're interpersonal creatures. We are wired to relate to other humans, and relationships are part and will continue to be part of our lives. And interestingly, both of those, in my opinion, concepts are connected because how we think about and care for ourselves, like you were describing in this kind of example of rebuilding the confidence in ourselves, is going to then impact how we're showing up, relating, connecting, expressing ourselves with other people. So I think most roads lead to I'm having issues or difficulties in either of those areas. And I think the first foundational shift that happens for people is when they discover the practice or the action of becoming conscious. And the reason why I think that's so impactful and foundational is, is two part. I think so many of us, you know, believe that we are our actions. We're are the thoughts in our head. We are all of the habits um, that I describe in the workbook as the habit self. We've become so merged with those aspects of our identity that a lot of us feel helpless, powerless, unable, disempowered. We can't create change. And once we begin to act as the observer, see those things, see the endless thoughts running through our head that are repeated day in and day out, experience the sensations or the feelings that are always coming up in our relationships, right? Seeing the habitual ways we attempt to navigate those or the stress responses, right, that we've been talking about. Once we learn how to sit in witness of them, we've already in action created a bit of separation. They're part of us. They're very much coloring our experience of ourselves, our relationships, and our world. Though in that space, it also gives us the opportunity to begin to make those new choices. And as members or humans who meet this work grow in consciousness, I think that is one of the most empowering spaces to be because it also then allows each of those individuals to honor the unique nature of those journey, the unique different choices that you know you Doug might have to make and different than me Nicole might have to make in all of those areas to begin to live more in alignment or care and compassion for ourselves. So I think most roads lead to I'm stuck in a way of you know caring less about myself or I'm stuck emotionally in my relationships and I can build my way out of that by first becoming conscious to how and why I'm stuck. Speaking of feeling stuck, one of the things that I've seen over the last few years, specifically as it's become more popular to heal and to work on your past, is I feel, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, that people almost become like addicted to healing. And they're doing nothing but healing. So like every time something comes up, they're like, all right, I got to go back and see what happened in my childhood, or I got I'm still healing, I'm doing this. And sometimes people just stay stuck in that and they don't like move forward. They don't like try new things so that they can like see if anything that they've learned can be applied to their future self and stuff. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think there's a fine line with this healing journey where people can just become so obsessive with it that it actually holds them back? Absolutely. I think, you know, anytime we become obsessive in thought, that removes us from that pure state of consciousness. Consciousness is being present to what's here right now, right? Anytime we're in that overanalyzing function of our brain, which is what you're kind of describing, like, oh, this thing is happening. What does it relate to in the past, right? I'm thinking about 
my even thoughts at times, that's an action of that overanalysis or of the thinking mind. And that's different than just being the observer of, oh, I've had these thoughts, you know, in this moment, I'm having this reaction in my body. I don't need to dive down. And for some of us, I don't even think it's necessarily needed or helpful or possible. And of course, I'm speaking to all of the people out there who, you know, relate to my journey that I speak about often, which is I have limited memories of my past. There isn't that movie that I can go and revisit to even explore what exactly happened? And anytime I get asked some version of, is it necessary to exactly know the details, especially if you're someone who lacks memory like I do or has limited memory, my answer is always the same, which is no, because the reactions, the patterning is here now. And even obsessively, like you're saying, diving down that rabbit hole to, to explore, even if for those of us who do have those memories, is taking us out of the present moment because it's in the present moment where healing happens. And speaking to, I think, another part of your question, which is the over-focus or obsessive nature of the action of healing, right? A lot of times we associate healing with actions. I'm meditating. I'm moving my body. I'm, you know, doing something. I can make a large case because I definitely fall into this category. I actually used actioning or performing as a way to avoid myself and my feelings. So for me, the bigger part of my healing journey now is learning how to stop, how to rest, how to just be and honoring my body when it doesn't have the resources to keep me propelling myself into action. So that is to, and I do think sometimes we do associate healing with doing. And for a large portion of us, healing is actually in learning how to feel safe in just being. And speaking of yourself, I mean, obviously you've become quite popular over the last few years and, and, and you have like millions of people that, that follow you and that, you know, really admire your work. But I also know you're a human being as well. Have you in the last few years like noticed yourself like having built really impact your mental health or even have you ever felt like distance from your truest self or inauthentic at any time over the last few years? I think the thing that I deal with on a somewhat consistent basis because like I was sharing one of my patterns of dealing with things that are uncomfortable or to keep myself achieving or moving forward. I've done that since I was a little girl, excelling in softball or school. And I continued up until I got my PhD and I still see remnants of that running my own business, having, you know, projects that I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to complete with deadlines. I wake up every morning, Doug, to a possible endless to-do list of things that I could do starting from the moment my eyes open each and every day. The point of choice for me always is in creating the space to honor the being, like you're saying, the human behind all of that obligation, all of the things that I could and maybe even want to. I'm excited to do, but making sure that I keep the priority and the focus on caring for the vessel that's going to show up at this later time to do it. Because what I do see sometimes for me is a tendency to, upon opening my eyes, instead of you know keeping my phone away from me and taking those moments that I've carved out to connect with myself, move my body in the mornings, I'm in my email. I did it this morning. I'm in the portal of my membership. I'm responding to members because I was just on vacation for a week and now I have to catch up. And so that is something that is always at the ready and always giving me the opportunity. And like this morning, I will share, I went into the portal and I dealt with work first. I did so though consciously. And that I think is the biggest shift. I know this about myself. I had that opportunity to click into the portal or to shut it down and go take care of myself. And this morning I made the choice to tend to the members in my membership. Maybe tomorrow morning or later today, I'm going to make the choice to go and do that yoga, right? That I didn't do or what have you. So just using that as an illustration that in my opinion, choices that are made consciously always empower us. And that's, I think, one of the major things that is still ever present in terms of then how that connects. The more I'm doing for other people, I'm doing to achieve, I'm not giving myself the opportunity to connect with what authentically I might need in that moment, which might mean to say, you know what? I can't be available to you right now. I need to take care of me. Thank you for opening up and sharing that and getting vulnerable. I mean, I know it's not always easy to talk about these things when, you know, you're in the profession that you're in and the, the work that you do. And I know one of the fundamental pillars of your work and your new workbook is, you know, making choices from a place of consciousness and becoming aware of like what you're doing. And there's so many people that 
I mean, not only are their nervous systems kind of dysregulated, like we touched on at the beginning, but they're on autopilot and they have no idea. Like, I mean, they really don't have any awareness on the choices they're making. They're just going, 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 and they don't take the time to understand, like, is this really what I want to be doing? Like, how am I treating this person? Am I really behaving like within my integrity? Like, whatever the case may be. So how can somebody in this world where people are so busy, they're so overwhelmed, they're, they're, they're dysregulated, as we've talked about, how can they come back to a place of consciousness to become more aware of the choices that they're making, the habits that they're forming, so that they can become a better version of themselves? I think the most foundational choice in the workbook begins with this choice of really first kind of introducing this idea of how habited, like you're describing, we all are, how autopilot most of us are living on. And it involves then, you know, many different types of exercises to build that foundation of consciousness. Because without that, you know, as we then progress through the workbook in terms of reconnecting with my physical body, learning whether or not I am in one of those states of dysregulation, learning how to meet my body and take care of my nervous system so that I can then, when I go into the mind section, learn how to deal with my emotions, these deeper childhood wounds so that I can remain regulated so that ultimately I can meet my authentic self, reconnect with that heart space, that you know deeper place of us that is intuitive. And I begin with that practice of consciousness because without it, right, I'm not going to be able to connect with those deeper aspects of myself. So that means making that small daily promise somewhere in your day, you know, understanding that we all wake up to different degrees of obligation in different environments with different circumstances that we're living in or around or among, and ultimately making that commitment to somewhere in your day. And I'm often shouting out the technology that we all live with, maybe even setting an alarm, understanding that creating a conscious check-in or in a, a moment in time where you tune into your body in a conscious way or your experience in a conscious way will likely be unfamiliar. So you probably will forget to do that. So that might mean setting the intention in a journaling practice in the morning, setting that alarm in your phone for later in the day, writing a post-it note, right? When you walk by the refrigerator as your reminder, whatever it is, reminding yourself to then take the most important step, which is action, building that conscious check-in, using, like we described earlier, your senses, the feeling of your body on the ground, or maybe just the feeling, the natural rhythm of your breath in that moment as that hook for attention and keeping that commitment and beginning with one moment in your day for a string of days until you do it more often than you don't do it. And then maybe building in two, three moments and over time knowing that on the neurological side of things, you're actually firing your brain in these new ways so that over time, what was well a not so traveled pathway will become more and more accessible so that you can then become a conscious participant in your life throughout the day. And I really do suggest, urge people to really take the time on that step. Because then as life's happening, as stressful events are happening and thoughts are whirling through your mind and feelings are whirling through your body, you want to be really proficient in being from that observing space. And it can begin with one of those small moments in time where you make that commitment to learn how to be conscious to yourself in any moment of your day. Right. I love how you talk about like setting the reminders in your phone, because like you said, like the phone can be a great tool. And it's like, you see this a lot with people who are struggling to drink water. They set an alarm like every few hours, like drink water, drink water, drink water. And it just gets them in the habit of doing it. And you start to like rewire those pathways so that you can form new patterns, new behaviors, new habits to become like better at whatever it is you're trying to get better at. And I know a lot of the work that you talk about in the workbook comes back to making these decisions from a place of consciousness. And I know one of the things that so many of us, including me, struggle with is these negative thoughts, these limiting beliefs, this I'm not good enough, I'm not lovable, I'm a failure. I can go on and on with examples of these types of things that go through our head. And while, like you've said, and, and I, I agree with you that you shouldn't just push these thoughts away because I think these are, they're trying to tell you something. What can we do to like unlearn some of these thought patterns in a way that we can try to reprogram ourselves to not get so caught up in them each and every day? Yeah, I think, you know, again, honoring that those thoughts are even there for a reason or are grounded in an experience. Most of us in adulthood have some version of that deep rooted feeling of not 
being good enough. You know, maybe we were the child whose parents were completely absent and we were then left to feel not worthy, not good enough for their love, their presence. Maybe we were the child whose certain emotions, you know, there was no space for them in the family home. And now we were given the indirect message that those aspects of ourself aren't worthy, aren't good enough, aren't able to be shown in our relationship. So, you know, I think a lot of us, you know, have that grounded in our lived experience. So, you know, not again, just arguing in a way or minimizing it because the feelings beneath it are real. It's incredibly painful to be raised in an unsafe, maybe in, even an abusive environment with parents who weren't attuned to you or interested or able to be for whatever reason, there's pain underneath of that. So allowing the pain to be present, I think is absolutely part of the journey and where we can empower ourselves. So meaning when the pain is there and the thoughts are there, they're real. The choice we can begin to make to empower ourselves is how much time we're spending in those thoughts. So while we might not be able to stop the thought as it's coming, right? An event happens and my brain assigns the typical meaning and always assigns that this happened because, oh, lo and behold, Nicole, you're not good enough. My favorite version of that is I'm not considered. I can make meaning out of anything that's happening in my day-to-day -day event and all roads for me, Doug, lead back to, this is further evidence of how this person doesn't consider me. So that thought has been offered by my subconscious, typically, again, because for me, that was the meaning that my child mind made from all of the moments that my emotionally unavailable mother wasn't there for me. My mind made sense of it that, oh, of course, she's not considering me. She's considering someone else at that time. So while I can't stop the thought, I can make the most empowered choice beneath the thought. Because what most of us do is we continue to repeat the thought. We hook onto the thought. We think about the thought so much that now we feel nothing but not good enough in that moment. So the thought happens and I can remove my attention from that thought. The less time I spend reiterating that thought, refiring that pathway over time, the weaker it'll get. And then I can begin even to begin to practice new thoughts that will over time become our new beliefs. What a new thought is, this is an affirmation. I'm sure listeners probably have heard of mantras or affirmations or statements, right? That is the beginning of a new belief. So at some point in your day, maybe if you feel not worthy enough, affirming that you are worthy, not expecting to believe it, because your whole life you've been validating and your environment is validated how unworthy you are. But again, that will become the first seed, a first you know, kind of firing of a new neural network that if you affirm consistently enough, while you're also spending less and less time affirming that you're unworthy, over time you will begin to believe your worthiness or whatever the version of the narrative is for you. I really like how you pointed out that with these affirmations and trying to, you know, rewire your belief system, if you will, it's it's not about you believing these affirmations. It's about you just saying it to yourself enough so that over time, like you can start to, you know, rewire your thinking and start to unbelieve these limiting beliefs and start to believe some of these new beliefs that you're trying to form throughout the process. And I know one of the things that a lot of people also struggle with is that once they start to do some work on themselves and they start to maybe go back and you know heal some trauma, they start to go back and look at their inner child and, and reparenting and a lot of the stuff that you talk about, they get they develop an immense amount of anger towards like people in their family. And maybe the people in their family, like they just did the best that they could and they weren't abusive. They just maybe didn't have the emotional tools to parent in the whatever way these kids maybe need to be parent or, or whatever the case was. How do you help somebody? like make peace with their past so that they just don't all of a sudden just cut their parents like out of their life, even though their parents just aren't bad people. They just maybe didn't have the emotional tools to raise them in the right kind of way. Like how can somebody, when they start doing this work, come to make peace with that? I think first and foremost is honoring the anger, allowing yourself, regardless of what you choose to do or you know choose to how you choose to respond, hopefully not react to that anger. It's allowing that to be present. Um, anger, you know, is an emotion that typically signals a violation, right? Something overstepped my limit, my boundary, I was harmed in some way. So anytime we're feeling angry, that that's very real. There's information there. Even if it's about something that happened decades ago in our childhood, right? The journey isn't to just minimize it and, you know, kind of affirm to myself, well, now I'm 30 years past that childhood, I should be over it. I think 
the majority of this conversation has really illustrated all of the ways we're not over the things that happen to us and they are very real. So really allowing that anger to be valid, allowing you to and your inner child to grieve that relationship, that violation, that threat, maybe for loss. I know loss and grief and relationships that we imagined we deserved and we never had. That's all part of healing. And then, of course, you know, over time, I believe we can, some of us, you know, expand into a more compassionate space. Because typically what we'll see is all of the impact that past generations have had on us. And we might even be able to locate our parents even as a human who was raised by other individuals who were learning and learning in particular environments and passing on what was modeled to them. So while, you know, abuse, neglect, and all of the million things that painful, you know, things that happened to us in childhood are never okay, some of us can understand them from the limitations in what our parents received, what environments they, you know, grew up in, what tools they were given. And oftentimes very well-intentioned people were raised by people with limited resources, with limited emotional capacities, and with a limited ability to model healthier behaviors for their children. And whether or not that's, you know, it's not a necessary part of your journey, though for a lot of us, when we see the impact of past generations on us, we can then, you know, group our parents, even if they was painful, was hurtful, you know, what happened in that relationship, we might be able to have a bit of understanding. And then we get to choose ultimately, Doug, what distance we have, how we continue to navigate that relationships. And for some of us as adults, that, that does mean changing those dynamics, putting in a type of boundary, advocating for ourself in a new way. And for others, it just means having this level of awareness and continuing right to engage in the same dynamics with those people. That's beautifully said, because I think it's all dependent on, you know, not only what you went through, but where your your relationship with them is at now and what works best for you and, and making sure that also you're making these decisions and behaviors and, you know, choosing these behaviors from a place of consciousness and not only consciousness, like authenticity. And I think this is a good segue to kind of like get into that part of things, because I know your goal with everything is to get people back to their most authentic version of themselves. And I would say that one of the other struggles that people have is finding out if they're really acting like the person that they want to be and making sure that they are remaining authentic. Like, and how do they even know? They're like, I am being myself. Like I'm doing what I want, like this and that. How does somebody actually know if they are behaving and acting in a way that is truly authentic to who they are at their core? I love this question. And I very strategically, so the third part of the book is, you know, meet your yourself, your authentic self, your soul, whatever brand of definition you, you want to apply to it. I mean, I very strategically, Doug, put that at the end of the book, well knowing that most people that pick up a workbook called How to Meet Yourself are interested in that part. And the reason why it's, it's at the end of the book is because like the onion analogy, right? The conscious peeling back of all of these layers, learning how to regulate my nervous system so that I can uncover that self. And in my opinion, that self actually does reside in a physical part of our body. In my opinion, it resides in our heart space. We now know through multiple scientific research how powerful our heart is. For a very long time, our brain had all of the credit. We And we do have a very powerful brain. We also have a very, very powerful heart, a heart that emits an electromagnetic frequency, I think upwards of six feet even around us, which means that the energy of my being is in communication with the very real physical environment upwards of six feet around me. So anytime we're searching for whether or not we're using the words like intuition, authentic self, essence, you know, and anytime we're looking for it in our thoughts, in our mind, right, we're looking in the wrong place, in my opinion, because in my opinion, the language of our intuition of our authentic self is actually a, a body-based, a somatic language. And in my opinion, it it speaks through our heart in a more nonverbal way. For some of us, it, we can get a feeling associated with when something is quote unquote for us or aligned or we're interested in it, right? Our heart might feel, if we tune into our heart, of course, our heart might feel light, right? It might feel open. It might feel expansive. It might even feel a bit of like, you know, tingly excitement in that chest area. Alternately, if something isn't for us or is possibly not the direction to go in or might even be dangerous, we might feel a constriction in our heart. We might feel a heaviness, 
right in our heart. And the exact feeling, um, I really invite all of you listening to explore for yourself. And it happens when we have that space, that calm, peaceful, when our nervous system is even open to the messages of our heart. I love actually now seeing how this came full circle. When I began the conversation with the ventral vagal, right? I'm calm, I'm at peace. If that's nowhere present in your life, chances are you're not going to really be able to hear or to have confidence in that intuitive voice. So again, the reason why meeting our authentic self comes at the end, it's peeling back those layers, regulating our body, creating safety in silence. There's so many of us that are stuck in the fight or flight or the shutdown nervous system response that don't even feel safe having a moment to turn inward and listen to our heart. So again, it's about the whole journey of creating that space so that I can attune to what my heart is saying, because there is no rubric that's going to apply to all of us universally of a checklist of how I know when I'm authentic. Because again, that's within us. It's brilliant that it is. It's like our internal compass, literally, that we walk through life and navigate life with. But that's under the assumption that A, we're in a calm, safe body so that we can attune to our heart. And then that B, that we're taking those moments to assess, to drop in, to when we're unsure, right? To imagine different scenarios or paths or routes or relationships and to then get that clarity on what is authentically for us and what isn't. This is all coming together very beautifully, as you said, in that I think it's so important to understand how to unlearn some of these unhealthy coping strategies and bring ourselves back to a place of self-regulation and learn how to, to rewire our nervous system so that we can start to discover our truest self and learn that where we're not feeling authentic so that we can you know, come back to this place of authenticity. And I know one of the other ways you, you talked about you know, how to know whether you're truly aligned with your authentic self is like journaling practices. And I think this can be an easy thing, I think, for people to do when they're maybe in a place of regulation and they're calm and they're trying to figure out like, all right, like, let me just see like where I'm at. Like, what do I know about myself? What don't I know about myself? And how can I use this information to progress further down this path I'm trying to go? So what are some things that people can do from a journaling perspective to really go on this path of self-discovery to learn how they can become more authentic? I think for a lot of us, journaling is an incredibly empowering practice. And again, we can really personalize what the journaling looks like for each of us, where it happens in our day and kind of how it is that we approach it, you know, whether or not we're just kind of in an imagining journaling scenario where we do give ourselves a moment to envision a future that's different and exploring whatever it is, right, that comes up for us, or whether or not we're just kind of using a more free association or what that simply means is just writing whatever is top of mind version of journaling, which could be as simple as that, taking out a pad and a pen and just literally writing without care for punctuation or how it sounds, right? Without editing too, and this is more much more difficult than it sounds probably, just your stream of thoughts. And then experimenting, of course, with everything in between, you know, all of these different ways where using a pencil and writing, you know, or typing our thoughts, our feelings, explorative, and making sure again that we're doing so objectively, compassionately, because this is another one of those areas where a lot of us and the overachiever in me knows I can do this. We have an agenda. We have a idea of what is right or wrong or the perfect way. And, you know, we set ourselves up with these expectations around journaling even itself. So, experimenting, I think is something that I really do want to come back to with a way to utilize journaling as a sacred space, maybe even making a ritual around the time or where it is that you journal. And so that your body over time kind of begins to then shift into, okay, this is a safe space where I can begin to explore these deeper parts of myself. Because especially for all of us at don't have time to stop and ask ourselves, haven't made that a familiar practice, or maybe have avoided it because stopping and reconnecting with the self has felt so unsafe. Even the action of something as simple as journaling, right, will bring up that resistance that we've been talking about. So doing so in a careful, compassionate, and safe way, you might not exactly know or be able to imagine this future self initially, but maybe several weeks or months down the practice line of you creating the safety and of you just allowing yourself to write whatever is top of mind, maybe somewhere down the line, right, you can begin to explore these deeper parts of yourself. I think what you just said, so many people like need to understand 
like all of that because and really take it to heart because it's so important to really go on this path of self-discovery and make it again like what works for you so that you can you know work on this this path of self-mastery to be able to go down this journey to like really meet your future self which i know is exactly what you're talking about now and it's what you're talking about in your newest book and i think one of the things that that happens to kind of bring everything back full circle is that people will start to become more connected to their authentic self and they will start to do the work and then they will start to eventually get on the path to meeting their future self and then people will say you've changed or you know i can't believe you're acting like this and they'll start to question their authenticity at that point because now they're like wait have i changed so how can somebody tell if they're evolving and they're on this path you know versus that they've faded away a little bit and become inauthentic well i think you know change in and of itself is when someone is indicating to us or expressing to us that we've changed without even assigning meaning whether it's positive or negative change right that is sign that something is being experienced is different we are being experienced as different in some way and i think really oftentimes Doug, we do get that feedback, especially for those relationships that we've been in long term, especially those close family relationships, especially when someone only knew us one way as we begin to show up differently, at minimum, we're violating a longstanding expectation. This person has been used to us thinking, feeling, you know, showing up in this relationship, playing this role for however many years, and now we're not doing that. So at minimum, there's going to be a violation of expectation. And then, of course, we might have offered to us all of their feelings of what they're seeing and of how our now difference is impacting them. It doesn't, though, necessarily mean that we're going in an inauthentic direction or a negative, quote unquote, or bad, or however we want to label it. It just might mean that we're going in a new direction, which is then our, we give ourselves the opportunity to decide whether or not that's a positive direction, whether or not that's an intended direction, because the reality is, and I've had this and heard this from many of my old relationships, some of whom I have a new version of a relationship with, and some of whom I, I don't anymore have a relationship with. I've changed, I heard quite often, but again, it doesn't necessarily mean that the change was negative for me. It might have negatively impacted the relationship, and then we could give ourselves and the other person the opportunity to have all of the feelings about this new version of a relationship that either can or can't be part of the healing journey, but again, doesn't necessarily mean it's negative. While we might hear from the other person that it's being experienced, as I know I did, as negative, again, it's, it's up for us to decide because sometimes we do begin to walk in a more authentic direction and we do hear from other people all of this criticism or commentary that makes us question. And again, very beautifully full circle, as we're becoming conscious, as we're making and keeping these small daily promises and rebuilding this confidence. And over time, as we're becoming more and more attuned to our heart, then even though it is difficult to hear and see the pain that change has caused our relationships in the world around us, we can rest more and more affirmed and securely that this is the direction that we will continue to walk in. This is our authentic space. And I think this is an awesome place for us to kind of close the conversation because everything has kind of come back now full circle where we've talked about like the importance of making these conscious choices. We've talked about, you know, authenticity, bringing ourselves back to a place of self-regulation and learning to, you know, change the dynamics of, of certain relationships and so on and so forth. That's why it matters so much to do those things is so that when you're on this path of healing and you're starting to make different decisions and you're starting to evolve as a person, you're able to consciously take a look at what's actually going on and take some time to reflect and respond versus just reacting. Because if you were just in react mode, you would just assume that they're right. I got to just stick with this, this tribe because they are right, like I'm becoming a bad person or I'm they're right, I shouldn't be doing this or whatever whatever the case may be. And then you end up just staying stuck in that same place time and time again, and you hear this a lot. So I think it's so important to just do like what we've talked about in this conversation and, to, and apply it to your life in the best way that you possibly can. So Nicole, I wanted to thank you for your time, your wealth of knowledge, and you know, let people know where they can buy the workbook, where they can connect with you if they're not following you already because people are going to want to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. I'm super honored to be back on here having another chat. Anyone who's interested in the workbook, I believe it's available where 
all major books are sold. You can check out the links. I actually have a Instagram page, I guess it is, How to Meet Yourself, the workbook, which has all of the different links there on Instagram. You can visit my website at theholisticpsychologist.com. If you're an Amazon fan or local bookstore, pop it in. It is on pre-order. It will be out published into the world on December 6th. So if you happen to hear this and order the book before December 6th, mailings will begin to happen on December 6th itself. Anyone who is out of the U.S. is interested in any translations, those I will get, continue to get word from the publisher. This is something that happens behind the scenes. My hope is that this workbook, similar to how to do the work, gets translated into as many languages as humanly possible. So I am doing my best to advocate for that. Um, though typically how it works, the US and the UK comes out first and then word comes in. So anyone who is hoping this does get translated, stay tuned. I will be shouting from the Instagram rafters where you can find me at The Holistic Psychologist if and when all of those hopeful international book contracts come in. So fingers crossed on that. Stay tuned. Of course, you can find me on the Instagram account, my podcast, The Self Healer Soundboard, my YouTube, The Holistic Psychologist, and all of the places. Amazing. Well, I'll make sure to plug that stuff in the show notes and congrats again for all of your success and everything that you've accomplished. And for those listening, I'm sure that you got so much out of this conversation. You're not only going to want to connect with Nicole, you're going to want to apply some of the stuff that you've learned. So what I invite you to do is to share a takeaway, something that resonated with you the most. Maybe it was something that we talked about when it came to coming back to a place of self-regulation from dysregulation. Maybe it was something we talked about, about rewiring your nervous system or how to to meet your future self, how to remain authentic. Like maybe it was something that we talked about as far as like making peace with your past and different relationships, whatever it was, tag Nicole, tag myself, because we'd love to hear your feedback. And we once again, thank you for listening to this episode of the Adversity Advantage. I'm your host, Doug Bobst. We'll see you next time.